All right, tonight I'm going to be covering a little bit about acoustic analysis of audio that's recorded the night of October 1st in Vegas on the shooting. And in particular, I'm going to take one example of one burst from one volley near the front center of the stage, look at it, listen to it, and look at it, and show you the tools that I use to make an analysis of the sounds that are recorded. I've written up a paper and I'll be showing you this paper. It's in PDF format and can be found at the link in the description under this video. Some people can't read PDFs so that's why I made this video. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, there's the usual information there, who I am, my email, that sort of stuff. Don't abuse it. Anyway, this is the table of contents. This paper is about 20 pages, and as you can see, I go through various items, including how you go about analyzing an audio, or at least the way I do it, with various tools. I'm very fond of Sonic Visualizer, which is a tool that gives a visual interpretation of the audio signal that is recorded. Many musicians use this to do speech analysis or rhythm analysis or beat tracking and things like that. I find it find it very useful. Anyway, I've got several figures and tables in here which we'll get to eventually. Anyway, uh, the main tools that I use are of course you use your ears and your brain but then you take a look at the the signal through a audio waveform plot and I'll be discussing that and what you can do with it, what you can't do with it, and what the limitations are of that and what the limitations are of of your ears. And there are plenty. In fact, just by listening to these things, I can only gar dig out about 5% of the information necessary to make a, a reasonable audio analysis. Uh, in addition to the waveform, we'll go through fast Fourier transforms of these things, which are spread over time and are commonly referred to as spectrograms. And then after a couple of those we'll go through spectral contrast analysis which gives us an idea of the uniqueness of an audio event relative to the background. And I'll be explaining quite a bit about the nature of gunshots which I think will be pretty eye-opening to some folks and old hat to others and then I'll wrap it up by applying these techniques to several audios or videos if you will and making a map of the characteristics of about a 20 gunshot sounds over the entire field that was the venue and way beyond. Now this isn't my information. What I'm really doing is regurgitating what a lot of people have done. This acoustic analysis stuff is an old field, well known, thousands of patents, thousands of papers, blah blah blah. Uh, one of the guys that I like to refer to quite often is an electrical engineer out of Montana State University by the name of Robert Mayer. And he does some pretty inter interesting stuff. Um, one of the leading experts in the field. You can find a lot of his publications here at uh, Montana and in this case the PDF has clickable links so if I click it and wait for this slow dog computer I have to open up we'll eventually see a list of his publications and below it is another link to his resume if you care to look anyway while that's taking the time to load um, we'll talk about the, I'm going to talk about the various sounds that are generated by gunfire or of gun firing. Uh, one of the first ones, or not first, one of the sounds that we're all familiar with is the muzzle blast and that is this big boom sound that you hear from a gun and it's for pistols, it's for rifles, it's for everything and it's a, it's a very simple sound to analyze. Um, one of the other sounds you'll hear is generated by the bullet when it's supersonic and it creates what we call a supersonic shock cone. 
and it's a supersonic shock cone because it takes the form of a cone traveling over time. Hey, I don't want this stuff. Yeah, performance bullshit. Um, anyway, some of the other sounds that can be generated from a gunfire, you can get reflections of the muzzle wave, and muzzle, uh, you can get reflections of the shock waves. You can hear the projectiles hit objects. You can hear ricochet sounds. And if it's not a supersonic projectile, if, i.e. if it's just fired from a, a pistol that's not supersonic, or it's fired from a rifle over a very long distance, it's a slowed down to subsonic, then you might hear whistling as the bullet goes by. A very common sound during the Civil War era. Uh, well, you know, the shell casings, when they hit, hit something, can make a sound, but those aren't recorded in any of these things that I'll show you this evening. And you can also sometimes hear, if you're up close, the mechanics of the weapon. But this paper for tonight, I'll just focus mainly on muzzle waves and shock waves. And as mentioned before, uh, my favorite tool is Sonic Visualizer, and here's a link to it in the paper if, if you want to go download it or look at it or anything like that. Yeah, I live near trains. So anyway, uh, if you go to the, the Vegas Shooting Map Project, uh, you'll be able to find this video that I'm taking Volley 5 from was recorded very near the, the stage ramp here, right up close, and in it you'll see that people are huddled around or behind some sort of lattice. Uh, this video records several volleys, and I'll be interested in the fifth volley. And I'm going to take just a small portion of the fifth volley, uh, about a 1.3 second segment of it, and it starts around 2 minutes and 23 seconds. And this is the third burst of volley five, and it would occurred would have occurred sometime around 10:09 and 55 seconds that evening. All right. The first thing you do when doing audio analysis, of course, is listen, and you find regions of interest in the audio. For this audio, when you listen to it, I hear about 12 distinct sounds. I hear some snap sounds, which are associated with the supersonic shock wave, and I also hear some boom or thud type sounds, which are associated with the muscle, muzzle blast. And in this case, smack dab in the middle of those, I can also hear a slightly different sound. It's not really a snap, it's not really a boom, and I'll explain that more later. Uh, all these sounds are quite audible over the background noise, and in the background you can hear sirens and screaming and thuds and all sorts of other things. So if we take that signal and we plot it as amplitude versus time then what we'll get is a graph with all these blue squigglies up and down. And in here you can see that there's these little peaks that are on both the top and the bottom of the graph because signal goes up and down and swings past the zero point and in the middle you'll see that there's stuff that doesn't look like it. So in this case I've marked what I consider to be the, the background sound and it's this little region right here extends all the way through and comes out over there. Um, a couple observations here is that the signals here are much more dense, that is there's more to them versus the signals over here. Um, how many are there? Well, I've counted them out. There's 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, on up to 12. Okay. Um, the other thing to notice about this, these is that these signals, these 12 signals, have a very sharp demarcation point, which we call an onset. Now, that's all fine and good, but I'm a visual type person, and I get far more information out of a spectrogram than I do out of this audio waveform plot. So let's pull up the first spectrogram which I normally look at which is a what they call a D in what visual sonic visualizer calls DB squared and it's basically a proxy for power. So here we see that same signal that 1.3 something second signal 
broken into frequencies on the left over here, which is a log, a, a linear scale in this case. And over here, we can see that as a time scale, we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things, or pulses, or percussive events as we call them, that are very similar. And then down here we can see one, two, three, four different types of pulses, which are clearly distinct from that. So immediately with this visual representation, we can say, hey, there's two types of events going on here, and they're quite different. The first one has a very broadband frequency response that goes way up into the 15 kilohertz. Well, not really 15 because this is a dB squared, which means that we have to take the square root of the frequency to get roughly what the actual frequency was. But there's a clear distinction between those two types of pulses. And then, as I had mentioned earlier in the middle here, you can see that there's some overlap. There's something in the middle that sounds different. And what we see is that we really have some more signals here that kind of look like that and they kind of look like that. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in the next spectrogram. From this power spectrogram, I can get a rough feel for what types of events are there, where they occur, how they might be broken out into groups, and approximation to their power. That all right. So, a couple of other observations here is that the signals at the end of this are much narrower and much more well defined. The signals up here are smeared. That is, rather than being just a straight up and down line, like these last four, they have the energy spread out over a fairly large period of time relative to the peak-to-peak -peak time, which normally indicates uh, quite a few reflections. May not, but just normally does. All right, so let's go to the next type of spectrogram I use, which again is a frequency over time, but this time on a logarithmic scale. And the reason, uh, with a different coloring scheme obviously, top one up there was a green, this one's what they call sunset. And in this case, a logarithmic scale is used because most of the sounds that we're used to hearing and that we want to know about occur, you know, below 2500 hertz. So we want to emphasize that range, and that's what a logarithmic scale will give us. In this pretty little graph, you can see that there are some pretty big distinction between these things. There are there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight s signals there, which are distinct from these up here. And again, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight here. This grouping of the signals up there are higher in frequency. These down here are lower in frequency. And these signals, which are actually the muzzle blast from the barrel of the gun are quite regular, that is the spacing between them is very regular. Whereas the sonic cracks up here, which are much higher frequency and more smeared, the spacing between them is not as regular. So when you hear these sounds, we hear first one, two, three, four sonic cracks, then we hear a muzzle blast, sonic crack, muzzle black, sonic crack, sonic crack, muzzle blast, sonic crack, muzzle blast, followed by four muzzle blasts. So the original 12 sounds that we could identify from the waveform plot have now turned into two groups of eight or 16 distinct sounds. Now the ear can't really perceive any two sounds as separate events that are closer than 15 to 35 milliseconds. So this overlapping between these sonics and 
and the muzzle blast uh, to the ear anyway at regular speed probably are not distinguishable except by their frequency. In terms of what I do from this point is I'm always interested in how long the gap is between the first supersonic crack and its corresponding muzzle blast which we call the difference in times of arrival or lag and here I've indicated the, the region you would measure for the lag for the first shot and for the last shot and from that lag we can make some pretty good determinations about the nature also here kinda covered up by the the label is the sound of a siren and then buried back in here a little bit is some voices but I've adjusted the spectrogram to highlight the muzzle and the supersonic crack sounds so for me this visual representation on this spectrogram makes it pretty immediately clear as to what's going on so let's see what other observations I notice here of course if you're interested you can measure the frequencies which I've done here and I've noted them the sonic supersonic cracks are you know higher in frequency and the muzzle blasts are lower in frequency even though there is a small overlap and we talked about the timing being regular and a little bit less regular on the supersonic crack uh, and that's about it so the next spectrogram eh, is what we call a, a con spectral contrast color and basically when you're having trouble looking at and deciphering these things spectral contrast can often identify where the event occurs because of it the difference in frequency changes from one point to the next so in this case we see that the muzzle blasts are all very distinct clear and not put in your face the shock the supersonic shock waves however are not quite so clear we can still count them but yeah it starts to get a little turkey one two three four five six seven eight so in this case we see that the, this one the eighth one and the seventh one are fairly distinct compared to the background the first one is two but this one isn't so there was either a lot of smearing going on there or the bullet was further away and thus the shock wave was less intense um, but again there's eight supersonic shock waves eight muzzle waves for a grand total of 16 sounds but there's really only eight rounds being fired because each round generates both a muzzle blast and a supersonic shock all right so this is all copacetic as my dad would say uh, with all the other spectrograms nothing particularly do except for the fact that some of the bullets were a little bit further away than others we probably could have seen that from up here in the power no not really so it did add uh, some value all right so now we go to taking real measurements from I typically do it from here what I would do is I would mark the time relative to the start of the video for each of these events all eight muzzles and then I would record it and that's what we have here is the time that that muzzle wave occurred relative to the start of the video which gives us and as you can see eight eight of them and then what we do is take the difference between each of them so that I can get an idea of the time separating each muzzle wave at least the time of arrival of each muzzle wave average it all out and we find that those eight shots were separated on average by 97.3 milliseconds so the second delta of this is an indication of how quickly the timing between shots was changing in this case since there's both positive and negative you can see that the time was varying between shorter and longer uh, pretty frequently you can take the delta which is the uh, the time between the shots and make an estimate from that on 
what the rounds per minute is by uh, you know one over the delta times 60 gives you the RPM basically in which case for all eight shots the average RPMs was 619 from this you can also see that you know it's not particularly constant although in general this volley was better than most in terms of regular regularity with the timing of the deltas all right and there's the simple formula for calculating our rounds per minute so what we see in this case if you uh, take a look at when the first and last muzzle arrived uh, the grand total is 0 0.680 seconds and we're going to compare that in a minute to the time for the sonic waves supersonic waves the average time which I mentioned already was 97.3 milliseconds and the average RPM was 19 so let's mo move on over to the same table but this time for the uh, supersonic shock waves so once again we have eight shots we have the times that they start in the video and the delta between them now in this case the average time between each shock waves was 95.2 milliseconds which is a little bit shorter on average from the average muzzle time and uh, the total duration was 0.662 which again is shorter than the total time uh, from this you'll note that the um, sonic shock wave does not preserve the timing of the muzzles that is the muzzles could be very regular and the super corresponding supersonics could be very irregular the total length of the time for each is not going to vary from uh, the supersonic to the muzzle by more than you know whatever the the, the lag is so it's not going to be 10 seconds variant let's go back up to here ah this in this uh, frequency plot here you can see that this gap is much larger than let's see that would be the second one so much larger than that and this is pretty typical of uh, of the supersonic cracks because the the time of arrival of the supersonic crack is a function of a few more variables than the muzzle the muzzle really only depends upon the speed of sound and the distance the Pythagorean distance to uh, the shooter between the shooter and and whoever is hearing it or recording it whereas the supersonic crack sounds or time of arrival of the sonic shock wave depends upon not only the same thing as the muzzles but you have the bullet speed relative to the speed of sound and you have the miss distance or the distance between where you're listening to this thing this crack and uh, the bullet path the bullet trajectory so if the bullet trajectory changes then it changes the entire timing of these cracks and that's typically what you'll see in the volleys for that evening is that um, the bullet never traveled the same path twice from one shot to the next and therefore the timing of the supersonic cracks changed accordingly whereas the muzzle blast which are not dependent upon the path of the bullet uh, and only the distance and the speed of sound were very regular they they accurately reflect when the round was fired whereas these are only indicative of and not accurately good accurate predictors of the timing all right so back down to measuring this crap all right and here over to how quickly the supersonics change you'll see that they're going back and forth which we'll cover in a different paper as to the meaning of that alright so now we've measured these lags the difference in time of arrival between the supersonic shock wave and the corresponding muzzle blast and of course the bullets faster much faster and therefore the wave associated with it typically arrives first and the muzzle blast arrives sometimes later and so what we do is we measure that for all of these shots and we come up with the average lag of uh, being about 392 milliseconds or 0.392 seconds again we'll take the difference between these two called the delta to see how much the lag changes from round to round 
and this will give us a good indication of how much uh, the bullet trajectory changed relative to our, our point of listening. And in this case we see that the minimum lag, the max lag rather, was 0.41 seconds, minimum lag was 0.38 seconds, and the different, they varied between those two by 34 milliseconds. That's not a big difference. So the grouping, as you would call it on these bullets, was pretty good, relatively speaking, to the other, compared to the other volleys. All right. Um, in this case, uh, the ear can hear the difference in the arrival of the supersonic crack and then the muzzle because 392 milliseconds is 10 times more than the ear needs to figure out that they are actually different events. One thing to observe up here is that let me go back up to the uh, this one. In the time time it ta takes the muzzle blast to catch up to its corresponding super crack uh, sonic crack, we have one, two, three, four bullets fired. And I have to get your head around that. A bullet. The first bullet comes out of the gun, and it tra is traveling. In this case. Who knows Mach 2, Mach 3, whatever, and it's but it's traveling fast relative to the speed of sound. So before the big blast coming out of the gun barrel, the, the muzzle blast can be heard. Three, three more rounds are fired, and depending upon the timing between the rounds, and how much overlap there is, some very weird and strange things can happen, particularly. Um, since the muzzle blast intensity and the sonic crack intensity vary in loudness differently. The muzzle blast being created right at the muzzle just continues to degrade in intensity over distance with the inverse square of, of the distance. The supersonic crack is continually generated by the bullet. That is for every little bitty movement that the bullet takes. Okay, I'm gonna fix that next time. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, for every little movement of the bullet along its trajectory, it generates a new s shock wave, and those shock waves collectively form the uh, supersonic cone. But we only hear a portion of it, and we only hear the portion that, you know, reaches our ears, which is a very small portion. So anyway, or another way of putting this is, one bullet can create millions of shock waves. Collectively, they're now referred to as the shock wave cone. And they propagate in a conic shape, which is roughly a, you know, a set of parallel lines at an angle to the trajectory of the bullet. Whereas the muzzle blast, it propagates in a spherical form or like an ever-expanding ball from the tip of the muzzle. So that's two different types of propagation and you have to understand that to have a, a good feel for the timing of these supersonic cracks. Alright, let's get back down here. lags. Okay, so we measured these lags. So these are the lags for burst 3 of volley 5. Um, you can do the same type of measurement for any video if it has both the muzzle blast and the supersonic blast recorded in the audio portion. Okay. So if we do that I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do that for several videos and we plot it on a graph of longitude and latitude, it produces a pretty interesting pattern. And this is pretty much what is expected for the scenario of this shooting. Here we see that uh the lag is measured from zero to almost 0.6 seconds in these color bands. 
This is a contour map. The little red dots indicate where I measured lag. Down here you have the Oasis Apartments. Up here you got, oh, I forget what the name of that street is. Anyway, it's about 3,000 feet from here to uh, the Mandalay Bay 32nd floor. Uh, the o Oasis Apartments, I think, is something on an order of 1,700 feet. And all these, you know, are various distance. Right here is, is the venue. What this um, map shows is that the lag or the time of arrival between the sonic crack and the muzzle retort, muzzle blast wave, is a function of distance at least. But not just the distance directly as you would think of it. It's the distance that goes this way, downrange, and the distance cross range. And for a particular ratio of bullet speed to speed of sound, the two dominant things are the downrange distance and the cross range, cross range distance, however you want to express it. You'll notice that there's a symmetry here about the middle of this thing. And that symmetry can be utilized because, in theory, that represents the traject average trajectory of the bullet. The further away from the shooter you are, the greater the lag within limits. And that would indicate that the shooter is over here at the minimal level. That is, the closer you are to the shooter, the smaller the lag. The further away from the shooter, the greater the lag. But there's a limit because the bullet starts slowing down, and that's why this jump has a maximal lag here and then starts dropping off. And eventually it'll drop off to subsonic and fall in the dirt, take a dirt nap. So, uh, the greatest lag is recorded on the, let's see, what is this, east side of the venue. And the smallest lag is recorded at a whole bunch of places. And what this indicates is that the shooting occurred at an elevated position. Because if you're shooting from an elevated position, there's a minimum distance between the shooter and the observer on the ground that's limited to the elevation of the shooter. That is, no matter where the position is, no matter how close you get to the shooter on the ground level, there's always going to be a, in this case, a little over 300 feet distance that the sound has to travel, either for the shock wave or the muzzle wave that's going to be added into the lag calculations. Um, so from this graph you can readily, well readily, bad word, we can we can make some more observations. And those observations are that along the line where if the missed distance, the distance this way is large, then the lag is small, regardless of how far down it is. If the missed distance, for example, from, I'll say those somewhere near the ladies, in the drive, uh, Uber, was it an Uber? I know, the ladies that were speaking Spanish in the car, which are relatively close to the average path of the bullet, i.e. the missed distance is small, they have a larger lag. So from this you can see that the average bullet path, average, here, and you could, you could do this for each volley individually, come up with the same map and come up with a more precise definition of where the bullet went for that volley. Anyway, the average path was this way. So from this we can see that the bullets were traveling from somewhere down here that direction. So from a southwest to a northeast direction. They weren't tra they weren't traveling from they weren't being so they were being shot from here and traveling that direction. No other spot within a few hundred feet is possible. It has to be elevated because of this shape. So if you want to claim that there's a helicopter shooting over here, then this teardrop, as I would call it, would have to be rotated up there with this point rotating up there and this point rotating down there. So as you can see, this graph pretty much excludes all possible combinations of shooting that are on the ground and that aren't in this general vicinity. Now this graph is more qualitative than quantitative. That is, this graph can't tell you much more than within a hundred feet of what was happening. But it is a very easy graph to generate 
lag is easy to measure using the techniques in this paper and you can get a very good idea and the more points you have and the further they're spread apart the better the idea you have now one interesting thing to come out of this is that a lot of people say that you can't hear the supersonic crack at more than 150 feet away from the, the bullet path well I wasn't there I don't know what it really sounded like but in all these recordings that are made you know, at a distance more than a thousand feet from the bullet path, there's very clear and some might say audible uh, recordings of the supersonic crack. So, you know, take it for what you will. I, I, that's a whole matter for another paper, too. But I wanted to show that anybody who wants to purport any shooting position that's on the ground is going to have to deal with this type of analysis which clearly demonstrates that the, sh the, the shootings were not. They were elevated. And they're also going to have to deal with, if you want to claim that uh, some helicopter from this side of the venue was shooting, then you're going to have to produce a lag map that looks like this, only rotated in that direction with this one rotated to that side and, and this one rotated over there. It's a pretty straightforward matter. Alright, so let's answer some questions that generally come up. A lot of the questions that come up are, yeah, oh well. Uh, how do we know these are gunshots? And we know these are gunshots the same way we know that we have a car parked in the driveway. It's from our experience. And in this case, I've looked at enough of them to recognize these gunshots. Uh, they match in frequency, they match in timing, they match in duration, they match in the physics of the matter, how the sonic is created, how the muzzle created, all those things on an individual basis conform to the theory of gunshot acoustics um, and there's plenty of people there's thousands of patents thousands of papers by thousands of experts on this stuff all you have to do is type in a search of forensic gunshot acoustics and you're gonna find more papers than you can read in a lifetime this isn't something that I'm making up uh, in addition we also have documented cases of people dying near where these volleys were recorded okay now some people will say that hey hey these were all just made up things and so how do we know that these sounds aren't coming from a speakers or an LRAD device or some other magic device uh, and in this case uh, the strongest argument is exactly this lag map and you can see that the lags vary from position to position. So if we go back up here and we're measuring just volley 5 verse 3, you'd still have the same phenomena for one volley or even one shot within one volley. The lag would be measured on each of those recordings approximately what's recorded here. So that would imply mean that a sound and phenomena was generate a, a phenomena namely the bullet traveling at faster than the speed of sound generated a wave and that wave was recorded on each of these locations but it was a different wave that is for Oasis the wave that was recorded the supersonic wave because of the physics of the wave that that crack propagates was generated somewhere close to the Mandalay Bay and it arrived over here at Oasis Apartments at approximately the same time as the muzzle wave. Or put another way, if the lag is small, then the, the propagation time of the waves are close, i.e. they traveled the same path. Repeating that thing, repeat that another way, if the lag between the arrival of the supersonic crack and the arrival of the muzzle is small, then the path from the generation of the muzzle is approximately the same length as the path of the generation of the sonic wave which occurs along the trajectory of the bullet. Conversely, the smaller the misdistance becomes, the opposite becomes true. That is, for small misdistances, the lag becomes big. The, the supersonic crack will arrive much sooner than the muzzle and that's pretty obvious because if the the bullet just misses you and goes over your right ear uh, you hear it basically the uh, 
the uh, Pythagorean distance divided by the speed of the bullet. But it will take the muzzle blast, uh, not traveling the exact same path for sure, and I'll discuss that momentarily, uh, the same distance. Or excuse me, that <coughs> erase that. The muzzle, muzzle blast has to go all the way from the shooter to the recorder, and that's divided by the speed of sound. The supersonic crack is generated by the bullet, and in the case of large lags, it's generated very, very close to the observer. So in this case, right here, the bullet went either left or right or above, very close. And the, super, and the, the, the uh, crack that you're hearing was generated very close, and that's why the crack can remain loud. So for these red items here, the crack, the uh, bullet was much, much closer than for the blue items. And uh, that brings up, you know, another peripheral concept, which is when you hear a crack, you will look instinctively look in the direction that the sound came from. And in the case of a sonic crack, it does not point to the shooter. If a bullet, for, for this observer, if a bullet went by his right, the, let's, say the, let's say that this observer was looking at Mandalay Bay, and a bullet went by his right side, that supersonic crack would be generated right very close to his ear, and his head would turn to the right to identify the source of it, and he'd be looking way over here past the Luxor. Similarly, if the bullet was to the left, he would turn left, and be looking way down here towards the convention center or even further beyond maybe even McDonald's down there or something so the bigger the lag the smaller the missed distance the less the supersonic crack tells you where the shooter is the muzzle always tells you where the shooter is if you can identify its location and that you know brings up well you know which is louder the the crack or the boom it varies from position to position. The closer you are to the shooter, the louder the muzzle. The closer you are to the bullet, the louder the uh, supersonic crack. And, you know, they combine into maybe one wave, and sometimes it's hard to separate them. Sometimes they block each other out. And, you know, and there's reflections and reverberations and oh, just a whole bunch of stuff. So this really is a, a simple example compared to many that have to be an analyzed. All right, let's see. Next question. So anyway, the fact we're back answering the answering this thing of how do we know this isn't generated by some magic device? If you uh, broadcast through a single speaker two waves, a uh, let's call them the fake waves, a supersonic crack, and then 0.2 seconds later a muzzle blast, blast that those sounds from a single speaker would be broadcast out over the entire venue with that point two separation. That is, there would be no change in lag regardless of your distance. So if there's a change in lag with your distance, then it can't be a single source of sound. It has to be multiple sources of sound. And the only way of generating multiple sources of sound is with an actual physical phenomena where the second one at least one of the sounds is traveling faster than the speed of sound or with a holographic projector and to my knowledge no such device exists but in any way if you want to claim these were LRADs or speakers then you're going to have to generate as many unique combinations of muzzle blast and sonic wave as there are recording devices which is you know that's just an impossibility all right We already talked about why the time between rounds is different for the muzzle and the sonic waves. You can read it here if you want to. And then I go into, you know, just things that bolster why these are actual gunshots. You know, they match the, the frequency matches theory, the duration matches theory, uh, the fact that there's even a supersonic crack says it's a rifle, you know, just a whole bunch of things. Uh, you can also answer one other question by measuring 
the uh, time between bullets and what or what we call the cyclic rate of fire and you can't answer it solely on the cyclic rate of fire you have to measure the variance between the timings and I did that in another paper which is linked here and what I basically assert is that uh, it's more likely that these were bump fire stock than machine guns and while some machine guns are, are kind of erratic most are not but on the other side of the coin bump fire can get close to the regular cadence of a machine gun as we saw here in volley 5 anyway uh, you can you can read the summary but it's basically saying that if you rely upon your ears you're only seeing a, a tiny fraction of the information that's necessary to make a, a realistic statement on these things these uh, rounds in this case we saw that there somebody could have interpreted this as 12 shots they could have been interpreted as two types of guns but it's not it's eight rounds one type of gun with two types of sound being generated by each bullet and they you know overlap in a way which is interesting all right there's some other conclusions I reach in here but they're pretty trivial and you could read them for yourself so that pretty much concludes uh, this talk for this evening